And uh, so, no, we're delighted to be with you. I have never heard anybody do what you're doing in this afternoon of really singling out the fivefold ministry and just trying to describe it to people. And Ben, that thing that all of you, Oscar, and all of you worked on and Ron Cantor and all of all that, the fivefold ministry, so, so good. And uh, we've been on a lot of those calls as well. So all of you are blessed to be a part of this, and as are we. Uh, we, we I, I miss being with you, and we were, we were both intending to come to the conference here before anybody ever asked us to participate, and then you started asking us to participate, and we're delighted to do it. So anyway, I um, uh, one of the things that that I wanted to, s- to say at the first is uh, I-, I didn't see this for years. Of course, I was reared in a Christian church that uh, didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit or prophecy or Israel or anything like that, and uh, I was actually uh, I began to get the Israel message as uh, as of course Ben and Todd and some of you know. When during the Jesus movement, I was pastoring Belmont Church, and we had Jewish people that were coming to faith, and they were dealing, they were beginning to deal with it in a fresh way, because they never, I mean, they were saying, we're still Jews, and wait a minute, are you grafted into us, or are we into you? And I had to deal with it, and that's how I got involved, and, and how I got connected with Beit Messiah, because I was needing help. And I would always call Big Messiah, Dan, Asher, Aton, when they were Keith and Andrew, <laughs> and uh, would yeah. talk. Yeah, would talk to them about. Do we need to have these people here? So anyway, it, it, it's been quite, it's really been good. Okay, just here are some of the kinds of things that Todd and <laughs> McDowell and I <laughs> have been processing through this. Just sort of praying through some of the things that are stirring in our heart because. We deeply are involved, I mean, and, and we want to be in. One of the first things that I thought when you were talking, Ben, is that everything living reproduces itself. And so apostolic ministries reproduce apostolic ministries. Fivefold ministries reproduce fivefold ministries. Apostles reproduce apostles ultimately if they're, you know, they have people around them. Pastors reproduce pastors. So really, we're all sort of, in a way, we're all supposed to be serving people. So there's a pastoral aspect of all of our lives. But anyway, here's, here are some of the kinds of things that just to start off with, and, and uh, Todd and I have some of the same kinds of things, but he'll enlarge on some of them. And one is that a, a pastor is obviously, he's a shepherd, and he's responsible for get, being sure that this flock has good food and that they're not eating poison or that they're they're being protected from the wolves. And so, that because there's a lot of, frankly, there is a lot of deceit in the Christian body today. People are teaching error. I mean, we've had some stuff that's going on with, in Israel, as all of you know, just recently, and that some of it was heresy. And, uh, and so a, a pastor, and whatever kind of pastoral heart you have, pray for your pastors that also become people that are pastoral to other people. And then, obviously, you can't, you can't give what you don't have. So if you're not a person of the Word, if you're not a person of the Spirit, uh, if you're not a person of prayer, you can't reproduce that. I mean, a, a, a person that is not a person of prayer cannot raise up prayer people. We, have, we only pre- reproduce who we are. So one of the things that I would challenge everybody about is to be the people that you want to be and, and that God wants you to be so that you can reproduce that in other people. And uh, I, one of the things that I immediately thought of too when you were assigned as this pastor thing was that some years back at Belmont, I realized that we did not have, we didn't have any prophet that was speaking into the life of the congregation. And, I would, and from Ephesians 4, these fivefold gifts are ascension gifts to prepare God's people with, with works of service so that the body of the Messiah could be built up and we all come to unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God. We cannot mature without fivefold ministry. 
We can never become all that Yeshua wants us to become if we don't have all of it. And we realized we didn't have prophet speaking. And so we, some of us went over to Rick Joyner's fellowship for a while, just sat down with him and for a few days. And then we brought James Gall in. He'd not, at that time, not moved to here. And then we began to have prophets coming in. I mean, Dutch Sheets, Chuck Pierce, Bob Jones, Paul Kane, they all came to Belmont at some point because we realized that we needed that to be sure. So we, these are just all things that, that have to be there if we're, going to, if we're going to be the Lord's. Now, another thing that, and, and Ben, I said this in the leadership conference, but I want everybody to hear this too, that if you see, if we see our, the kingdom of God through the eyes of, of our home group, through the eyes of our congregation, through the eyes of our network, then it, and I didn't say this to us, but it can be divisive because we're seeing just who we are. But Paul says in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse six, that we are seated together in heavenly places in Messiah Yeshua. So uh, if, if we are seated up here, then we see our ministry through the eyes of the kingdom. So I think it's very important that we get that view of things. We can't, we at Caleb can't see the kingdom through the eyes of Caleb Company. We've got to see Caleb Company through the eyes of the kingdom. So it's all, you can't even, excuse me, but you can't even see the kingdom through the eyes of the Messianic movement. You've got to see the Messianic movement through the eyes of the kingdom. Because that way you, you understand that there's the joining together of all these. So, I, I mean, I guess one more thing that uh, you cannot, you can only have as much authority as you're under. I mean, if a person, you will never be a person of authority unless you come under authority. And so even though I'm a few years down the road, I still feel that I am under authority. I'm not a, I'm not a maverick. I'm not out there by myself. I mean, I, I would just share with Todd, even though he's 40 years younger than I am, and, and he is submitted to me, although he's a director, and he does the work, and I get the credit now. But... At the same time, there is a sense in which I feel under his authority because he has right to speak into my life. And so anyway, those are just some of the kinds of things that, I, that were stirring me as we started. Awesome, Don. Wow. So good. You know, I would say out of everybody that I know, Don really carries the pastoral uh, calling, anointing, um, and he has raised up many uh, even the famous musicians that um, Ben was referring to, I see Michael W. Smith has a very pastoral heart. When I ask Michael why he does what he does, what's his passion, that's what I ask everyone. And he said his passion was to release identity and encouragement to the whole body. And every time he does a concert, he just speaks encouragement and life that he's received from Don. So my first point would be to re reiterate that I believe that, well, first, let me just say, you all are called to pastor. Pastoring, just like I love Ephesians 4, there's the gifts that of those that maybe have the capital P, you know, the fivefold ministry equippers, but they're equipping, their job is to equip all of us right. to pastor. And so if you know anyone on the earth, your, your role is to pastor which means to nurture, to strengthen, to feed. You know, the word pastor comes from the Latin root of to graze or to feed. And, and the connotation is a shepherd leading sheep to graze and feed. So I, I want to make it real practical. Each of you have relationships in your life that you're potentially responsible for, especially if you're married or have children uh, or any kind of leadership at all. Your role is to serve them and to pastor them in a way where they are strengthened. And I want to read one word um, that we use at Caleb Company uh, in, in part of our equipping. Uh, the reason we do what we do is out of Matthew 24, 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the masters put in charge of the servants in his household 
to give them their food at the proper time. And some translations say good food at the proper time. And then it goes on to say, you know, some wicked servants, you know, on the other hand, would abuse the fellow servants and drink wine and get drunk. And there's that picture of pastors can be self-serving with their authority and take advantage of the people they're supposed to actually lead and become intoxicated on their own, you know, privileges, which we see in the earth. That's why there's so much bad press and that why that article had to be written to really apologize for the abusiveness of those called pastors. But I love this says that the pastors are fellow servants. They're actually not, they're not in charge of the house. I mean, they're not the master. They are put in charge, but they're not the master. And so there's that humility, like I'm a fellow servant, but my role is to give you good food at the right time. And um, so it's, so it's a really, it's important. It's good food and it's at the right time. And personally, I realized as a husband, I've needed to learn how do I feed my wife? How do I feed my children? And then with the spheres of influence I have in the nations and with the team at Caleb and then why I'm in different spheres, how, what do people need for, you know, what I want to equip them and strengthen them. So it's not about, I have this great revelation. I got to preach it, everybody. But it's how do I serve and strengthen? Um, I really feel later in the impartation time, the other point that I really felt strong today was just that Don mentioned that you can't give what you haven't received. And I think Psalm 23 is the quintessential passage of pastoring. And obviously it's basically outlining uh, how the Lord pastors. He says, I am your shepherd. You shall not want, lack nothing. So a pastor's heart is, I want to serve such a way that there's, there's no lack. Obviously, there, everyone's not dependent on you, but you have this perspective, I'm going to give whatever it takes. I mean, like, that's my role with my wife and my kids. Like, what do they need? I need to, from the Lord, bring it, you know, and serve them. And then this hit me, actually, right before the lockdown. I was reading Psalm 23, and I never had seen this for all my years because I love Psalm 23, but it says, he makes me lie down. And I feel like as leaders and believers, we actually don't know how to lay down when we're supposed to rest. And, and we need to allow the shepherd of our soul, Yeshua, to make us lie down. And that was right before the quarantine. I was like, oh, my goodness, he's making the whole world lie down. Um, and then the whole thing with green pastures, still waters, I just pray at the end of this call, we really want to pray for a refreshing over you and, and that rest over your soul that you would be filled and, and and then also that you would see him leading you in the right path. You'd hear his voice. His sheep hear his voice. And he leads it for his sake. You know, it's he wants to lead you in the right path for his sake. And then the whole thing with walking to the dark valleys or the shadow of death, not having fear because his rod, which, you know, takes care of the wolves, and his staff that has the hook on it that pulls you close, that you'd be pulled close and that you'd be protected. And, and then you'd rest and you'd feast in the presence of your enemies. Even in the challenging seasons, you would learn to receive the riches. And then that whole thing with this anointing your head with oil, cup overflowing, you would just get so anointed by the Spirit, so marked, so filled and fulfilled. And then is you know, mercy and love following, chasing after you and dwelling in his house, that you'd experience his presence and your grid, I felt the Lord saying today, your grid, how you see yourself, what's going to, the Lord's going to allow to come to you would have to go through his mercy and his love for you. So I just, my heart is, I want you to be so filled and refreshed so that you could turn and pass all those things on to those around you that you have stewardship over. Um, so those are the, oh, the, the last thing just quickly. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is like a life verse, and it has to do with, I believe, God's call. is for Paul, it's like Don, Paul said, 
You know, the things you've seen and heard in me and other witnesses pass on that I've seen, I pass on to faithful men, reliable men, who will teach others as well. So there's four times of passing it on. And that should be our heart in pastoring is I receive pastoring. I'm under authority. I am accountable. And then I turn and find those that I can pour into. That's why Yeshua only did 12. You can really only pastor in a deep way around 10 to 12. That's why small groups are really good around that size. People have studied this and found it wasn't just random. Yeshua created the perfect model. And if you pastor those 10 to 12 really well and equip them so they can turn around and teach others, then there's this legacy and this multiplication. And um, we love that at Caleb Company. You know, Caleb wanted to take out giants, but then he, when it got to the biggest giant, he turned to all the young guys and said, hey, whoever takes out that last giant, you get to marry my daughter. Because he wanted grandkids that were children of giant killers. And that should be our heart. We want to raise up the grandchildren, you know, and spiritually that are giant, sons and daughters of giant killers. So you need to raise up giant killers. And then it's crazy. I was reading First Chronicles 27, and I would blew my mind. It's um, where is it? Is uh, 2715, and it talks about David. You know, set up an army. There's uh, 24,000 troops, 12 months a year. The 12th month was the the commander of those 24,000. It says he was from the family of Othniel, which was Caleb's son-in-law, the giant killer that Caleb raised up. So 400 years later, there's still that legacy of warriors being passed on. So that's my yeah. heart for all of you, that you would pastor so well, and you would it would just multiply. Todd, one of the things that you said there really struck me. Um, you know, sometimes we think of pastor as being the head of a congregation or a church. And we think the same about a lot of the gifts, that if you have, don't have the title of evangelist or prophet or pastor, but God gave the Ephesian four gifts as ascension gifts for the whole body so that it would function and operate. And it doesn't mean that you have to have the office, the title of it, right. to be able to work in it. And, and even more so, the greatest revivals of history are when lay people take up the call to be effective in discipling and pastoring other people. Uh, because the small groups is where everybody has an opportunity to exercise pastoral gifting. It's love, it's discipleship, it's serving and shepherding. And in point of fact, in the New Covenant uh, Apostolic Witness, pastor is only mentioned one time. And so it's not something that's focused on but yet it's all throughout, it's weaved throughout the Psalms and throughout Yeshua's ministry, it's modeled. And this is a, such a great, great, uh, both of you really, really added so much uh, flavor to this discussion. Todd uh, Westfall, do you have any thoughts you would like to add, any comments? Uh, just say yes and amen. Um, I think that um, a key for us, um, I just want to share a resource uh, and how that resource has helped me, uh, which really enforces what Todd and, and Papa Don have shared with us today. Um, this resource is called Jesus the Pastor. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, I've had it for over 20 years. It was given to me by a, a, a friend, and, and we were youth leaders together. And um, there's just a lot of keys in it. Uh, what This gentleman wrote it. Um, from a conversation he had on a plane traveling to do ministry. And he was sitting with another leader and he says, who's the head of your congregation? And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, who leads? Who's the, the leader and the head of your congregation? And he said, well, the Lord is, I, I guess. And he said the guy kept asking him and asking him because that's not the answer he was trying to get. He was trying to get him to take responsibility for the congregation. And he realized that though he said the Lord was the leader, the Lord really wasn't the leader because the Lord wasn't leading him. He realized he needed to be shepherded by the Lord every day 
and to allow the Lord to shepherd him. Now, pastor isn't used a lot in scripture, but shepherd sure is. It's everywhere. And uh, roe. So we want to be shepherded by the Lord. And I wanted to just read, if I could, really quick, just a little line from this book, just to give you another resource. It isn't messianic. It's not, uh, it is in that it's about Yeshua. But uh, first and most importantly, every pastor must be pastored by Jesus himself. He is, after all, the pastor of pastors. As we consider the spiritual disciplines for us in Messianic Judaism, that's reading through the Siddur, doing the Shrakri prayers, praying, seeking the Lord, all of those things should bring us to the heart of God, uh, should bring the heart of God to us. So the spiritual disciplines were impressed with Jesus' consistent and intimate union with the Father. Likewise, all pastors who long to be like Messiah must cultivate a genuine, intimate, conversational relationship with God. Reading scripture, great devotional classics, praying and singing the Psalms back to God, worshiping the Father, journaling in spiritual experiences. All these are many other practices can be very effective in helping us to have encounters with God that leave us refreshed, recharged, and ready to face whatever the ministry might have. So many of us spend a lot of time preparing for ministry, but I believe that the Lord wants us to spend more time letting Him prepare us relationally with Him. So I just want to echo what they said. So, so good, Todd. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's uh, shift our phase a little bit. I'm interested to hear from you. What is the Lord stirring in your hearts, those who are on this uh, call, this workshop together? And if you have questions, then we'd like to have you submit them and uh, maybe Don and Todd and Todd can help answer. I'll share a little story if it's all right. <clears throat> Go ahead, Scott. So I've always heard this phrase, nickels and noses, how uh, pastors, when they get together, well, you know, we took in this much of an offering and we had this many people. Oh, yeah, well, we had this offering and this. And uh, one day it was brought home to me. We were attending an event in Washington, Washington D.C. We had about 10 of us in our group. And we were walking from the event back to our car. And the, and the sidewalks were crowded because it was like the 4th of July. It was a big event. And uh, I knew where the car was parked. So I kept turning around like every five seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then I'd go a little bit further and I'd turn around and I'd count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And um, I was counting noses. But I realized I wasn't counting noses so I could tell people, hey, I had 10 people at the fireworks display. I didn't want to lose anyone, so I was counting noses. <laughs> and um, so it was driven home to me uh, by someone like who sometimes is referred to as Papa Don, but, you know, I don't think I've ever heard him refer to himself that way. But uh, he is Papa Don, who said what he just said there a few minutes ago, that pastoring is not the job of the pastor. It's the job of, the, of everybody in the congregation. And I always tell people, if you're here today and you notice that somebody's missing, because of the fact that you notice it, you are obligated to make a phone call or to reach out to that person and make sure they're okay. It's probably innocent. They probably had something else they had to do, whatever. But because you noticed that they're missing and you didn't know that they were going to be missing, it's your job. And I just encourage people to pastor. It's your job to notice. It's your job to reach out. It's your job. And, um, and I think that's what the pastoral ministry is. It's equipping people for the work of pastoring. 
Excellent comments there, Scott. Very, very good. Others? You can just pull yourself off of mute and then ask your question or make your comment. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, hey. Rafael Silvia. Hello. Hello, it's so good to see you all. Just such a blessing. So many memories from, from learning from you. I'm thinking right now about the different kind of people we have in our congregations. Uh, in terms of pastoring, we, we did a lot of work with the youth, and I guess now we're in a different season, um, not probably as much in touch with the youth in general, but how do you, I guess in our congregation, some of ours are smaller, so others are big, bigger, how do you make sure that you reach out and pastor everyone? Sometimes there seems to be some kind of lagoon, maybe the kids, the children, the singles, um, even women, you know, we as women also have to support in that pastoring role. So a, any kind of ideas on how to make sure you pastor the different people, the demographics, just. Who, who would like to take that? We could share uh, two points. I'll, I'll start and Don will finish. Um, one thing that I really believe uh, is key is not just pastoring uh, a pastor is not an answer man or just a teacher right um i mean there the equipper is the one in the office needs to mm -hmm. equip but i really believe the as don talks about authority is when you're already walking in something you know even the designation of the offices in fivefold ministry somebody needs to already be functioning and then they're a point, they're acknowledged, right? And, and, set, and set in place. I believe that one of the keys with young people, youth, children, older people, and this is what we've really embraced with Caleb Company and what I've seen over the years is we need to model healthy family. And you can see even Ben and Lorena sitting there. You know, I know Ben and Lorena, I've been in their home. I've seen their children interact with them. They then shepherds his family well. That gives him authority to speak about how I should live. And I think that when we're, you know, if you're called at any level of, of pastoring or shepherding, your marriage is the very first place you need to be really good at pastoring mm -hmm. and shepherding. Your own natural children. Now, I understand children have free will. As they get older, they can make choices, and it doesn't reflect always on the parents. I've learned that the hard way, <laughs> and thankfully my kids are all coming, you know, strong. But, but really, your authority, I, this is the key. I, if you look at the ministries around the world, just think, even, you know, like Bethel or something, when you see a family where the children are raised up, not that every family has to all be in ministry, but when you see healthy children and healthy marriages it gives an authority and a respect like nothing else it's better than a master's degree a doctorate degree when you see children healthy and strong in the lord you're gonna say i want i respect that father i'm gonna come under that and that mother and so i just think modeling healthy family and pastoring families not just the individuals and so when i'm coaching or pastoring, I'm like challenging young people. How are you submitting to your parents? Are you honoring them? Talking to the parents, are you serving and loving and giving yourself and not just focused on your own hobbies and your selfish? Anyway, that's, I would say it's pastoring families and modeling healthy family is a really big key. And, and uh, one of the things when, when you were talking, I'm thinking about pastoring everybody in the church and, or in a congregation like that. And uh, several years ago, I was headed north on the highway and I was in Kentucky and I was, I was driving into a city and there was a huge billboard with the picture of a man on it. And he said, I want to be your pastor. And I thought, no, he does not. <laughs> he just wants to have a bunch of people come and tithe to him so he can do whatever he wants to do. 
You can't pastor 5,000 people or 2,000 people. You don't even know their names. You don't know anything about their children. And so that's the, so we, we have to pastor people to pastor people. The only successful way that you can have a huge ministry is by having multiple and unpaid, I'm not talking about pastors on staff. I mean, you, you can't have enough pastors on staff to pastor a thousand people. I mean, Jesus could only pastor 12. That's about, but, and, and I, honestly, there are times when I ask myself, who are my 12? You know, who are my closest brothers or families that I, and I could, I could, I, could, I don't know if it'd be 12 or not, but I could name you right now the certain people that are, I'm really tight with. And that's okay. And I can't be tight with everybody. And then I, sometimes I'll ask myself, who are my three? Because Jesus has three. Peter, James, and Paul, John. You know, I mean, I know some of those apostles got jealous of Peter, James, and John sometimes. So they had this problem. But Jesus wasn't worried about that. I mean, he, he had certain things. So I think the key is shepherding the people in a way that they shepherd people. That's the only way. And then and I, I told the story in the leadership uh, conference that uh, we had, that it's so important. I, I think it's hilarious that the Lord has pushed us out of our buildings so that we have to know who are we really close to. And I was reminded of years ago, there was a couple that was every single Sunday, they were at a certain place. I can tell you exactly the few they were sitting in, but they were in community. And there was a death in the family. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, I'm going to go to the funeral home. There may not be anybody there. And sure enough, this is the honest truth. I drove to that funeral home. There was only one car in the parking lot. There was no other bodies except one. I walked into the room. That one couple was before the casket. Nobody else there because they weren't in community. They were in church, but that didn't count because the, he didn't call us to be in church or congregation. He called us to be in community. In fact, the best translation of Ecclesia is community. The Tree of Life translation doesn't have the word congregation. It's community. Rich, uh, Tyndale's congregation, uh, translation in 1525 and Martin Luther's in 1517 didn't have the word church in it. It's community. God called us to be in community. But anyway, fast forward, there was another tragedy in a family, but that family was in community with every, I mean, they were tight with people. They, they did birthdays and vacations and family groups and small groups with them. And there was a tragedy. I went to the hospital and there were hundreds of people there praying because their community had community had community. That's the kingdom. That's so powerful. Wow, both of you. I just uh, am thinking about the people in uh, my life I've seen on both of those sides of the spectrum and how sad it is when people attend a, um, a, an event every week and don't get the fruit of the relationships that are off on offer and the health that comes from sharpening one another. And so that's really, a, I think, another role of a pastor is to take steps to urge people into relationship. It's um, that coaxing that's a healthy coaxing, you know, that just says, come alongside, be a part of something more and deeper. You can have this, this healthy relationship. So that's good, modeling that. Uh, Mike Rudolph, you had a, a comment that you wanted to make. Thank you. Um, when our congregation was smaller, I tended to know everyone in the congregation. Now, um, we've gotten bigger, and um, we have some people that come, they stay for a while, they leave, they, new people come, they stay, and they stay. And it's, it's gotten harder to um, keep in mind who the regular people are and, and who the people are that are just passing through, it occurred to me uh, at some point that I was losing track. Uh, and um, so I discussed this with Aaron, and we decided that uh, we were going to try an experiment, and it's still in the experimental stage. 
uh, we were only four weeks into it. What we did was we assigned, we took our, our, our contact list and we broke it up into sections and we assigned sections of the people on the contact list to different leaders. And uh, we asked the leaders to um, uh, call or email, somehow contact. Uh, if, if they were part of their Chavra, then that was a contact. But the idea would be to check every two weeks and find out how people were doing, especially in this particular time uh, with the virus and everything. And people um, being home, uh, they're not used to it. Uh, it affects people in ways that are unpredictable. So that's what we're doing. And uh, the, um, there's an accountability attached to it, which is that we're asking that uh, every two weeks, it's reported back to me by email that each of the people who have a responsibility with people on the list are to report back to me. Now, they don't have to report back details. All we want to know is that they've contacted people and that everything's okay. That would, that would be the, great, the greatest response. But, uh, but if everything isn't okay with someone, then we'd like to know that person and what's not okay uh, in their life. And so it, it's, it's not a big reporting burden but it's a burden to spend the time during two weeks to contact people by one means or another and just check on them. And so we're, we're hoping that everyone will get a contact call or email every two weeks. And that will, if something is a problem in someone's family that we'll know about it and we'll have an opportunity to see how we can help, help those people. I think that's very, uh, very, very good, Mike. We um, did something similar among our eldership team here in Jerusalem uh, to try to reach out to every single person within the community so that, um, number one, relationships were strengthened. So this, we saw this as an opportunity, actually, of something that we had never done before, which was call every single member in the community. What a novel concept. And uh, I think that it was amazing, the response. Sometimes people were like, thank you so much for reaching out. Like, you're the first person who's ever called me, and I've been locked at home for two weeks. So what we're starting to see is that that relational in, um, focus of how to build real relationships with people is, is a high, high standard for, for pastoral ministry. And I think that what Scott said earlier is also very important is that it has to be done by everyone. Everyone has to take some responsibility toward pastoring each other, uh, not again, lording over each other, not manipulating each other, but building the kingdom together and caring for one another and providing for one another's needs. So a very, very good comment. Uh, Peter Lundgren, you had a comment or question you wanted to make. You can pay, take yourself off uh, mute. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I might have missed a detail or two in what Don said about this family. Uh, a family member died. Um, and uh, was it their child or, or who? But at any rate, it was just the one couple. It was a parent. Okay, so the parents are at the funeral home by themselves because they weren't in community. What, no, what no. One of the parents died, so the couple oh. were there with one of the parents. Okay, so what, I, what I'm wondering is, um, it's my feeling that somebody that doesn't really connect much should still be cared about. And I would think that people in the congregation knew that this person had died. So um, they, weren't they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't even know? Yeah. Oh, nobody all knew. Did, all they did was come and occupy a pew on Sunday morning. They didn't get close to anybody. Oh, okay. All right. So that answers my question. I, I was just thinking that, I mean, anybody that 
knew should have gone just because they cared about somebody that didn't care enough to connect. <laughs> you know, but, but apparently they they just didn't even know. That's really sad. Um, I'm sure I spread the word around a little bit, but yeah, because I mean, I have a question for uh, for Don and Todd actually. Um, in your ministry life, uh, a lot of pastoral ministry, what would you say are the, the traps and the pitfalls that you've had to guard against so that you can stay faithful in those roles? I could start just real quick. Uh, obviously, it's Yeshua mentioned it, wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, that you can't pastor a wolf. And... I've found the enemy will try to distract us and get us the, the, some people are not willing to really receive or learn or grow. We still love them, but we don't, it's like investment. You know, we, you, you feed the sheep, but if they're just there to kind of uh, do their own agenda or take, um, I think truth and love is, is really important. And that, I think that's why pastors really need to have prophets around them to discern, hey, that's a wolf. So I think the danger is in pastoring is if you're just independently pastoring without apostolic, you know, clarity, this is the the boundary, so to speak, of my, this congregation and this is the mission and and these are the, the you know, tenants. It is, so just having clarity and guidelines and boundaries is really helpful for pastors because they can get – just so caught up in serving others that they just drift down the street and end up burning out or having wolves come in and distract and actually undermine. And so I think having prophets and apostles as the kind of the foundation for their pastoring is really crucial. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the first things I thought of is, um, I mean, just, a pastor is being a workaholic, you know, and really neglecting family even, but also just getting to the place of total burnout. And I don't believe the Lord burns anybody out. I think there are two reasons why people burn out. If you're doing something God did not call you to do, and we can do that many times. I'm a people pleaser, and if, but I can't be a people pleaser. And, and so in my godly place, I'm not a people pleaser. Because if I were, if I would, I would, I would totally wear out. So there's that, 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 and at the end, it's passing mantles on down to other people. There's another thing though that uh, that I thought of when you say that, and I will just say this to all of you: I never, I, I, okay. There are two things that I've done through the years. I never travel by myself. And I, I tell people there are three reasons. One is I don't trust me. One is I don't trust the enemy of where he might put me in some kind of situation and accuse me of something that I didn't do because I'm by myself. And I'm to pour my life into younger men. So I never travel by myself. And then the other thing that I never do, I never counseled women. And every office I ever had, there is, a, there is a glass there that you can see into the office to see what's going on. We always have a glass at the top. I, would, I might see a woman one time to find out what the problem is, then pass her on to somebody else. I never counseled women because I think it's too dangerous. And even if it's not too dangerous for me, it's too dangerous for them. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I had that happen to me one time. And anyway, I just, that, that's a core thing. Those are dangerous, huge dangers for anybody. Those are so good. And especially because uh, in both the non-counseling women and, and the purity, but, but there's a temptation for anyone who starts to have influence to have pride also rise up at the same time. Because when you feel needed, you, there is a sense of self a, like a rival that exactly. starts to develop. And I've, I've seen this even leading home groups. I've seen, you know, whenever you have influence over anyone 
and God has given that to you, it can become a source of pride and, and manipulation and control. And then you spend so much more energy trying to fulfill either people's expectations so you continue to be stroked with affirmation or you will work yourself to death and, and burn out or you'll put yourself in situations that compromise your, your integrity and your righteous you know, holiness before the Lord. So I think those are really, really good traps. I would just say too, one of the things... One other thing, Dan, I, I realized that I just said there are two reasons to burn out. One is you're doing something God didn't call you to do. The other is you're doing what God called you to do, but you're doing it in your own energy. Those mm-hmm. are the only two reasons why we should burn out. Excellent. And, uh, you know, another thing is betrayal. Just um, learning how to deal with betrayal and identification with Yeshua and identification with Jesus and what he suffered. Willingly putting people in his circle that he knew at points of their life would completely betray him, reject him, deny him, and that God will allow people in our lives that do, whether they be temporary wolves or people that are like Judas who really turned his heart against the Lord completely. And uh, so, so that's another thing I would say for pastors. You have to get yourself ready that betrayal will come and you rely on the cross. Uh, you identify with the cross so that you can still make yourself through that. Um, Nestor Lima, you had a question. If you could go ahead and take yourself off mute. Shalom, everybody, and thank you so much. My question has to do with timing, the sermon, the timing for the calling to uh, pastoral. Briefly, I was a gangster. I grew up in the D.C. area, and I was selling drugs, trafficking weapons, New York to D.C. Had a powerful encounter with Jesus, December 4th of 1990. And a year later, I started preaching the word, just fell in love with his word. And so throughout this time, there's been seasons of time where I have felt a strong calling to pastor. And for whatever reasons, it hasn't happened. But it's, I'm in that season again. And this is the reason I enrolled for this uh, breakout session. We have been in the congregation we are. We do pastor small groups for the last uh, Several what, years, five, six years, and and I get so much, so much out of it. But again, I understand the concept and the um, importance of being under authority and being sent, because uh, it it is and it is a Hispanic congregation that the Lord is calling me. That I sense that He's calling me to to pastor with a emphasis, a heavy emphasis on our Jewish roots. If a person really feels called, um, I mean, you start praying into it, and and you have to. I mean, one of the ways God confirms it is that He opens some kind of door. It may not be what you thought it was going to be, but He opens some kind of door for that to begin to happen. It may not be the dream. I mean, something that. And I'm not talking about a dream in the wrong way, but when you felt like God was calling you to a certain thing, but you take any step in that direction that begins to open up to you. So God has to confirm that what you heard, you can pass that by other people that are in authority or that are you're accountable to, so that all of you are praying together in it. But then God ultimately has to confirm it by opening it some door. Amen. I would encourage you, I don't know if you have a, a mentor or a spiritual father, um, if it's your pastor, but being able to pray and, uh, and get good godly counsel uh, for your heart, you can sense the burden of your heart for the gospel and for pastoring people. And uh, I would just encourage you, one of the things that I've done when, when people come with a calling is I try to really hear what their sense is. And sometimes I'm the spiritual father. Sometimes they have others that are, and they they receive good counsel. But oftentimes in that, the Lord will give you a path. And sometimes when you're walking out a path, you're, you're looking at the end result of that path, wanting to be there, and you can miss the process that the Lord wants so that when you're there, you can stay there long. You can endure what it takes. Sometimes we look at it as jumping through hoops, or we have to do this, or we have to do that. But it's really, God is a God of process. 
He enjoys the process of conforming us to his image, causing the fruit and the power gifts of the spirit to be developed in us. And, um, but he'll give you the steps with a mentor. And, um, and I would just continue to pray with them and God will give you clarity. He, he has in my life and I see a lot of heads nodding on here. He'll do it for you as well. And maybe we'll have some time of impartation prayer for you. I just feel like I want to pray for you, but we'll, we'll go on and have some of that. Yeah, there's only about six minutes left in our call time here, and I really do want some impartational prayer from the the folks uh, from Don and Todd and Todd, um, and and if there's others who who really um, want to participate in offering up a prayer, that would be okay. But I really would like to just receive from them um, over these last couple minutes to receive that impartation. There's some great questions that we didn't get a, a chance to answer. But look, we only had an hour to scratch the surface of pastoral ministry, which is a huge topic, and it's really a core of, of the five-fold team. But, um, but we thank you for joining us, and we really uh, pray that you'll just receive from the Holy Spirit the direction and the leading to find other people that you can continue this process with, as Todd was saying. And uh, let's just uh, soften our hearts before the Lord and allow Him to work as they pray for us. Lord, I thank you for these people that are gathered here this afternoon because you have put a genuine hunger in their heart or they wouldn't be here. And they, you have put a hunger in their heart. Even, even the two Todds and Ben and Lorraine and I, we're still hungry for more. Mm-hmm. And Lord, thank you because you promised that if we hunger and thirst for righteousness that we would be filled. And Lord, I pray for every single one here and every member of your family. I, I put you under what I call the family psalm, that blessed are those who fear the Lord and find great delight in his commands. Your children will be mighty in the land. I put my weight down on that, and, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm talking a little bit later about believing the word and not what we see. No matter what you see with children or whoever it is, we put our weight down on what God says and believe we have more. And so thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that we are living in the time of your return, that the season of your return. I thank you that we're headed toward the grandest revival in history. I pray you will make all of us eternal optimists, that we will see through the trouble into strength. That we will that we will endure anything that's going on and knowing that you're going to work it for our good. Lord, I thank you for this whole movement of Jewish people that have come back to faith and covenant partners with them. This is the core of what you're doing in our generation. So we bless what's going on here. We embrace the, our Jewish people that have come back and we stand on your word that you're going to bring Israel back to you. Not just a few hundred thousand, you're going to bring them back. We say that declaring it on the basis of your word, not on the basis of what we see in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, Father, I just ask you to come and bring your glory right now to everyone on this Zoom call. I ask the release of your presence right now, like mighty waterfall, your word would cascade down upon us. And I just prophesy over you that you'd receive shepherding so you could in turn shepherd all those around you and receive from those in the office of shepherds in your life. But the Lord is your shepherd. You shall lack nothing. He makes you lie down even now in green pastures He leads you beside the still waters. He restores and refreshes your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. He guides you and leads you in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though you walk in dark valleys, shadow of death, you will fear no evil. For he is with you. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. He prepares a table, a feast 
before you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil. Receive it right now. Your cup overflows. Surely his goodness and his love and mercy will chase after you, follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in his presence, in his house forevermore. I just pray that a commissioning over you to chase after the shepherd of all shepherds, receive his heart, his love for others, and turn and love, shepherd, pastor, those around you in your sphere of influence in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Abba. Avina Malchino, our Father, our King, we honor and bless you. Just stand in agreement with the prayers that have been prayed. We say, Bo Buach Elohim. Lord, we thank you that you don't always call the qualified, but you qualify the called. Lord, I pray for the qualification of just your presence and your love for each one on this call, your desire to see them to be all you've created them to be. Lord, help us to transition in times if we're always doing to transition into being, to be with you, to be in you, to, to be who you've created us to be as your children. And, and I pray for those who are anxious. Your word says that uh, to not be anxious, but to, to ask God, to, to pray and seek God, and he will answer. He will give you what you need. And I just sense to read in, uh, from Jude as we get ready to close, and, and then Ben can close us out from there. But um, thank you, Lord. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God while you're waiting for the mercy of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, which leads to eternal life. On some have compassion, using discernment. On others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment stained by sinful nature. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless before his throne, before our God, rejoicing in glory, hallelujah, the only wise God and our Savior. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. Lord, we thank you that you are able to keep us. You who called us are the keeper of us. And we love you. And I pray an encouragement and strength in the spirit for us as we follow you and serve you as you serve. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Mm-hmm. I just want to give another uh, thanks to Don and Todd for joining us as guests. And then, of course, Todd, uh, part of our family, Todd Westfall. Uh, but we love you. We, we are just so appreciative. I'm hoping that we can see you again face to face soon. But, uh, but praise God. It was a really, really wonderful hour together.